Hello, everyone. Thank you for your attendance. Today's topic of this session is climate tech investment and startups, which is the most the hottest topic in startup sector. So today, I invite two great investors from Silicon Valley who are at the forefront of climate tech investment. And thank you, Tommy and Chow. Thank you. Honor to be here. Yeah. So, so currently, uh, there is a significant amount of cash being <laughs> pumped into the climate space, right? So as far as I understand, you know, more than $100 billion has been pouring into the space. But still, some you know, business people and corporations are a little bit skeptical about the potential of new climate solution from a business perspective. So is it a profitable or you know, viable or you know, useful or I don't scalable? I think they're very fair questions. So today, fortunately, uh, we have great investor who will answer all the questions. So please give them a, round, a huge round of applause. So Tommy, Shao, so could you introduce yourself so starting with Tommy? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Tommy Leap. Um, I'm from San Francisco, California. Uh, I run a fund called Jetstream, which is a $10 million fund that invests in very early stage, pre-seed stage climate tech startups. Uh, I've been an investor uh, as a venture capitalist for about 10 years now. Um, I was the first hire at a fund called Floodgate. Um, and then I've worked with a few other generalist investment firms. In 2019, I was working at AngelList and I left uh, to explore climate change. A friend of mine gave me a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, uh, which explains all the somewhat terrifying and scary things that might happen to our planet if climate change continues as it does. It woke me up uh, to try to understand what can we do about addressing the challenges of climate change. And having spent a lot of time in the investment ecosystem in Silicon Valley, I started to look for startups and other VCs who are investing uh, on the climate change theme. And so I switched all of my personal investing to focus on climate in early 2019 and 2020. I um, spent some time working with a fund called Congruent Ventures, which is a seed fund uh, focused on climate. And then in 2021, I launched my own fund um, to invest in these pre-seed climate stage startups. So my, my main kind of worldview is um, actually um, it, uh, on the theme of climate sustainability and biodiversity. Um, and actually, before I get into the, the first startup here, I want to talk a little bit about my thesis and how I think about the big trends um, in climate right now. The main uh, technological shifts are that we now have a proliferation of low-cost sensors that help us collect information about our planet in a way that we've never been able to before. So that includes imaging from space, um, picking up weather in the stratosphere, uh, picking up information about the soil, about our oceans, and, and the deep ocean that we haven't been able to before. Um, we have, obviously, the uh, uh, new acceleration of AI technologies and machine learning. That's helping us understand all this data and apply it to solutions um, in a way that we weren't able to 10, 20 years ago. And finally, we now have um, inexpensive and very effective robotics mm -hmm. that uh, use machine learning and computer vision as well that can help us make changes yes. in the physical world. And you have some, you know. So speaking of right. yeah, robotics, Glacier is a, one of my portfolio companies. It's based in San Francisco that does automated material sorting in recycling factories. So waste is a big problem, and a lot of emissions come from waste. If we can reduce the amount of waste we produce, then it'll reduce emissions. To do that, we need to recycle and reuse a lot of these commodity materials. Um, uh, Glacier raised a seed round. They now have pilots in California, and it's a very smart uh, team. Here's a, a picture of kind of one of the robots looks like. Another company I'm excited about is called Simplifier. Excuse me, Simplifiber. They make clothing out of a liquid uh, cellulose material. So instead of the traditional um, kind of weaving and sewing methods of clothing, they um, they basically create their own liquid material from natural fibers. They put it in 3D molds and they effectively press it together. So this shoe shown here is actually. Uh, biodegradable and recyclable because it's made from an entirely natural uh, material. And they're, they have partnerships with brands and they're also expanding into clothing and other uh, materials like what you might find in a car. 
And then finally, I wanted to highlight a software-based company because most of my investments actually are software-focused. Sinai Technologies is based in San Francisco but has customers here in Japan. They're an enterprise software company that helps corporations measure their carbon emissions and determine paths to reduce emissions across whatever um, their business is. If it's steel making or um, you know, cement making, they help them find pathways to reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. um, they've been invested in by some Japanese investors as well. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you, um, great presentation. And now it's your time, Xiao. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Xiao. I am a very, very lucky idiot. My, my father was a poor farmer from Northern China. He grew corn and yams and thankfully for me, he realized that that life didn't have a lot of hope. So he studied really, really hard, was the first generation to go to college and then studied really, really hard again and was able to immigrate to America. And I, I tell you this because when I was growing up, he would tell me the story over and over again. He was like, do you know how much your grandparents suffered? Do you know how much me and your mom suffered? Like, you're so lucky you get to grow up in the States with every single opportunity. And I, I was like six years old. I was like, what do you want me to do with this information? And it, it created within me this kind of like void of sorts. I felt and I've always been afraid that if I don't do everything possible to make the most out of the advantages I've had, somehow I'd be disappointing my parents or my ancestors or all those other people in Asia who never got the same opportunities I did. And so for most of my career, I've asked myself a very fundamental question. Where is that place in the world that can channel and hopefully magnify this energy that I have to make the most positive impact for the world? And for a long time, that was starting businesses in very unsexy, dirty industries like metal casting or apparel. But I walked away from my journey as an entrepreneur feeling a little bit disappointed because the scale of the problem is so enormous that even if I was some Elon Musk style genius, which I'm definitely not, I could be creating two or three amazing companies, but it's still not enough for the world. Venture allows me to help all the amazing people in the world, like yourselves, who are motivated to try to change the world for the better. And maybe I can be involved in 100, 200, 500, 1,000 startups that go out there and actually make the world a better place. And that's how I found my way into venture capital and eventually to lower carbon, where our mission is to solve climate. And we roughly divide that into three main sections. There's, there's too much carbon in the atmosphere. Let's find profitable ways to pull it out. We need to reinvent almost every single piece of civilization to make all the wonderful things that make life worth living, but do so in a low carbon way. And thirdly, recognizing that this is a very hard challenge and we may need many, many years to do it. But in the interim, we need to adapt as a people so that life is still good. And uh, I want to introduce a handful of companies to give you guys a flavor of the kind of things that excite me. Antora Energy is making long duration storage. It touches on something that humanity has been trying to do for generations. We know how to store grain and food really well. How do we store energy well? And if they do that, then they can make renewables the cheapest possible energy in the world, displacing fossil fuels. Uh, next, we have Gridware which helps maintain one of the most important networks that we have as a civilization. The internet is cool, but even more fundamental than the internet is the power grid. We can't do anything without electrical lights and electricity. Gridware helps utility companies and grid operators understand, hey, where are the weaknesses in the electric pole and the utility poles? And how do we mitigate risks of wildfire and other kind of disasters related to the electrical infrastructure? And finally, I want to introduce Unspun, who's making something that we're all experiencing right now. Every single person in this room wears clothes. And clothing, they're just tubes of woven material. And Unspun has created a magnificent robot that's able to make the clothing we love without wasting fabric, without enabling long-term orders that sometimes stuff doesn't get sold and has to go to landfills. And it perfectly captures this thing that we believe in, which is we can enjoy all the wonderful things of our civilization without necessarily having to suffer or give up anything and still make it sustainable and it's, uh, clean for the environment. 
So I'm really looking forward to talking to you all today. Please, at the end, ask any questions. So excited to be here. Yeah, very exciting. So let's move on to the discussion part, right? So my first question is very simple. Is a greener business more profitable? So in the past, we have to pay a lot of green premium, right, to use greener solution. But why could you say that greener, greener solutions are now getting cheaper, better, faster, easier, and sexier? Why you can say that? Uh, give me a reason, Tommy. Yeah, well, I'd say a big part of it has to do with the technology shifts that we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and in, look at all of these industries and all of these sections that, as Shao was mentioning, need to undergo transformations to uh, bring us to a low carbon or zero carbon economy. Um, by necessity, the companies that break out into these spaces mm -hmm. We'll have to offer solutions that are, you know, not just better for the environment, but also cheaper. And so they're riding the coattails of a, of a lot of technological development mm -hmm. that a lot of which has been going on for the last 20 years and is now, um, you know, in this kind of re recent last few years is hitting its stride. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, the, the, we have a crazy unfair advantage in climbing investing because we're essentially looking for replacement products for things that you guys already use. And so we're, we know, for example, that if you can make garments 10 to 15% cheaper, that's a market that exists and it's very robust. If you can make certain kind of fuels cheaper, that's also gonna do really, really well. And at the end of the day, I, I, I'm cynical. I don't expect anyone to buy these products or do anything related to climate if it doesn't make financial sense. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, one of the biggest impacts that we can make is to prove without a shadow of the doubt that if you want to make the most money possible in the next five to 10 years, you have to be invested in climate. And once we prove that out, the larger momentum is capital from all different sources will rush into the sphere and that's how we, within the capitalist system, actually make the kind of changes that I think everyone's really excited about. Hmm, that's a beautiful answer. But give me, give me some example, concrete evidence that you, know, you can say greener solutions is much cheaper. The, the, the examples from the portfolio are, are a great place to start. Uh, Unspun, because they're able to make the garments, instead of cutting out pieces from a rectangular piece of cloth to make your clothing, they're cutting down on material waste by 10 to 20%. And if you can make a garment for 10 to 20% cheaper in a supply chain where people are fighting for pennies, that's something that all the brands are gonna be excited about. And Tora makes it cheaper than ever to generate industrial heat. And for the first time, we can store energy from the sun in both electrical form and heat format so that when you're making ammonia or making ethylene, you're able to do that at a substantially mm. cheaper mm. cost. And yeah. this is what excites me. The, the economics are known here. Yep. I'm not yep. expecting anyone to pay a green premium for any of that stuff. Uh, so many questions I have, but it's your turn, Tommy. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, I would look at, um, just look at like how the cost curves have come down for mm -hmm. solar and batteries. Um, you know, there, there have been significant advances there. And now clean energy in many parts of the US at least is much cheaper than um, energy that's derived from fossil fuel mm -hmm. kind of peak, peak or power plants. Um, it's just, it's already there. I think in, in transportation, we're already seeing with the advent of um, electric vehicles, mm -hmm. um, the total cost of ownership of electric vehicles for consumers is now cheaper than for uh, fossil fuel powered cars. So, um, and then and those cars are actually cheaper to manufacture because yep. you know, they're fewer moving parts and engines. So, um, we're, we're starting to see this across many different areas. We had a great panel yesterday yes. about alternative proteins, right. and a lot of it is because the unit economics, um, you know, cl climate change is basically driving all this innovation mm -hmm. among entrepreneurs who are looking at these areas with a new lens, yes. and they're getting very creative about how can we rethink about this with yes. lower, with cheaper unit economics, and then that, then the market forces kind of play out and um, yes. those technologies will rise to the top and replace the existing ones. Any specific name in your mind? So when we talk about uh, cheaper see. solution and a uh, profitable solution. Yeah, um, I mean, Shao talked about Unspun. I think Simplifiber is kind of in a similar category in the clothing sense. Um, Simplifiber collapses the entire um, clothing production change to basically using a machine that presses, you know, a material, a liquid yes. material and a machine that presses things together and removes all of the uh, human labor. So that's the kind yes. of using machines to remove human labor is kind of one of the big themes that we're now seeing um, kind of in this wave. Thank you. And I think everyone in this room would like to ask you, 
who is the next Tesla? <laughs> you know, it's a too direct question, I think. But any company's name or any category which attract you most in 2023? So any categories of technology or theme? Yeah, I can speak to it. You know, I'm, I'm really excited about energy production. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in the last 20 years in the US, the top companies um, on the stock market were basically all energy companies. Mm -hmm. And I, I expect that actually to happen in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, one technology I'm particularly excited about is geothermal. Mm -hmm. um, there's a company called Fervo Energy yes. that's based in, um, in the US that <clears throat> uses geothermal to provide clean energy 24-7. Um, so basically, at, at all times of day, it's, um, you, know, you can use that clean energy. And that can power, when energy is very cheap and clean and available at all times, mm -hmm that can then drive even further innovation. Is um, it scalable? You know, it, it depends a little bit on these geothermal hotspots, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, and then moving the energy around. Okay. Um, but I think with, you know, when we get to a point with enough investment, it'll continue to bring down the cost of energy in the same way that solar and batteries have. Yes. And Xiao, please share your secret source. I mean, I think what you're asking directly addresses the best part of my job, which is every single day I get to go out there and look for the next Elon Musk, the, the Teslas of the world, and the founders who have that incredible energy to change the world. Um, you know, the, the founders of Antora are a great example of this. They're, they're, they're solving a problem that humanity has been trying to solve for thousands of years when it comes to energy storage. And they have this just massive energy around it. I, I cannot imagine that they will ever stop working toward a future where humanity has unlimited clean energy and we've solved the climate crisis. And just like Elon Musk, they're not gonna stop with this first thing, right? They're gonna continue to work their whole lives to change the world. And I'm just grateful to be along for the ride. It's gonna be a fantastic journey. Yeah, it's, it's a super interesting for me to see a lot of you know, climate tech startup actually develop new solution with hardware component like sure. Antora. I, I, I never seen in Silicon Valley, you know, most of my you know, reporting is about you know, very digital services. Sure. Yeah. So it's very interesting. So next question. Oh, okay. So when we talk about the potential of climate tech solution, we shouldn't forget about the past lessons, right? So what did Silicon Valley actually learn from the clean tech bubble in 2000? What's the lesson from the, the rise and fall in a clean tech bubble? So what is your, your, your thought? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, at a high level right now, um, the environment has a lot of things that we didn't have um, in the mid 2000s. Um, uh, one, you know, basically all of the effort at that time helped get us to where we are today. There's a lot of investment in projects. Um, you know, Tesla kind of came through then, inspired a generation, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we have a lot of venture capital money. Um, Risk-taking money is interested in solving climate crisis. Mm -hmm. We actually know a lot more about the climate crisis. Um, and uh, back then, there was a, there was a lot of the dollars were chasing things that we thought were scalable, mm -hmm. but were not scalable in a classic venture capital returns way. Why did you, did you make a wrong bet, or why Silicon Valley investors made a wrong bet on clean tech? Mm. Why did I didn't make those investments, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I, I, I think there was a lot of uh, kind of hope and aspiration okay. and that it was important mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one, one of the issues is kind of the technological pace of development. Yes. And with software, you know, you can go from zero to, you know, $100 million company in just a few years with software. Yes. And I, I think we wanted to put that pattern against um, hardware at the time, but mm -hmm. discovered, you know, through trial and error that it, 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 it wasn't working. Now, however, I would say um, we know which components and which uh, parts of kind of investing and building technology does have a chance to be more scalable. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, Shao, could you elaborate on it from your perspective? I, I think the theme to keep in mind here is how powerful technology is. 
in the first clean tech wave, we misunderstood the market, or rather, I think we misunderstood what technology could do for oil and gas mm -hmm. and for some of the fossil fuel companies. A lot of the companies had these investments made with the assumption that oil was gonna go to 80, 100, 120, and never see sub $100 per barrel prices ever again. But then, People were clever. They discovered fracking, and fracking unleashed a torrent of you know, cheap and clean natural gas. And then all of a sudden, people saw that, hey, we don't have to worry about any of this clean energy stuff. Like, you know, fossil fuels are going to be cheap again. And it really destroyed the business model that a lot of these early entrepreneurs mm -hmm. were hoping for. Nowadays, that same kind of technology boom has caught up for the clean tech uh, technology's benefit. And we're not seeing a future where we expect fossil fuel prices to change in that dramatic way again. But at the same time, we know right now that the new technologies will make cleaner technologies cheaper and cost competitive. Solar and wind will beat the pants off any other kinds of energy right now already. And I think that's only a foretaste for this dynamic to continue on now and why the situation is very, very different. And if I could just highlight like, you know, what Xiao was saying, I really like that, you know, the the, the advent even of fracking was a technology mm -hmm. story. So though it was somewhat ironically didn't solve the clean energy problem, um, it, it was about the pace of change in technological development. And we're now at the cusp of that affecting many, many industries, which is you know, kind of very exciting for us. Yeah, that's okay. perfect. In short, you shouldn't you know, be against, uh, you know. Don't bet against technology. Yeah. Don't bet against yeah. technology, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so it is not a very exciting part, but you know, currently uh, we are seeing the market slowdown and what's happening in the climate space, so, Tommy. Yeah, so um, globally we've seen a, a market slowdown across many industries. Um, it appears from this slide that climate, the climate industry is, ha is receiving less investment. I would guess that it's probably on par or maybe not as bad as other uh, industries or segments of the economy. One thing that's not represented in this slide is what is the venture capital component of um, you know, this Q4 2022 $9 billion investment to climate change? And the venture capital component, I would almost argue, is probably increasing uh, quarter over quarter. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the biggest big funds like BlackRock, they might have reduced some of their investments. Um, but what we've seen and experienced on the ground is there are, there are more climate entrepreneurs than ever before. There are more climate VCs than ever before. It's getting even more competitive for us. Overall, that's a very good thing for the market and the dynamic, and it attracts even more entrepreneurs to work in the climate space. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's actually a very good story. The last little bit I'd add would be that um, when the, the market has slowed down, it's actually a fantastic time to be investing because the valuations of the companies come down. And as an investor, okay. if I can invest it's a, a great little valuation. chance to become right. a climate investor. That's right. That? Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah please do. <laughs> yeah, come to this side. <laughs> so anything to add from, from I, the I, side? It's, when we talk about this revolution that's going to define this generation, we're talking about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years to completely remake all the major parts of our civilization. In that context, a one year, two year market downturn, it doesn't mean very much. The long term opportunity, as Tommy talked about, is still really, really good. And we can't lose sight of that just because right now there might be some jitters mm -hmm. in the market. Okay. So this is the most exciting part in the session. Yeah. Next frontier. Yeah. So, you know, everybody, we are so excited to talk about kind of moonshot project yeah. or you know, kind of new revolution, uh, revolution of technology, right? So what is exciting for you when you talk about you know, next frontier from a long-term perspective? So Tommy, you can yeah, go sure. first. I have, I have two ideas that come to okay. mind. So one is this concept of space solar. So the what idea, is that? yeah, so yeah, follow me here a little bit. But the idea is you build satellites that have solar arrays on them. We put them on a, a SpaceX Starship. We blast them up into orbit. The satellite opens its array, receives sunlight, and then beams that light down to Earth on solar farms, kind of these large industrial scale solar farms um, that are in the dark at night. So when the sun is not shining on a solar farm, we can capture sunlight and, and beam, it, beam the energy back down to Earth. Are you serious? Over at night, yes. Is it viable business, do you think? So, so theoretically, it's viable. So on paper, it's viable. Kind of the computation okay. makes sense. But uh, there are a number of these projects that are just currently in development. Really? And so you know, we'll, we'll have to see how they play out. Um, 
and you know, it takes a little bit of time to make, uh, make satellites and get them into orbit. Okay, so this is the first idea. Or so that's one. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I think the other interesting one is, you know, so that's a very highly technical solution. The other side to me is, um, you know, maybe a more natural solution, and it's, it's this question of uh, how can we use basically nature or land that we already have? How can we preserve it? Um, how can we improve it to uh, basically help us balance um, or modify? Uh, just climate change impacts across mm -hmm. the world. So, you know, kind of more practically, um, you know, the rainforest destruction has a big impact on um, one on CO2 emissions, yes. but but two on balancing the yes. uh, kind of homeostasis of the planet um, and keeping us within certain weather bounds. Um, so, it's really important that we stop cutting down the rainforest and that we also um, improve other lands and rehabilitate them. Um, and there's a, a cool startup um, in this area that I've invested in called Cecil. Cecil. Cecil that um, provides a, a software platform for the project developers of these land projects mm -hmm. to receive all the um, kind of sensory data inputs of how they're improving the land um, and then present them to investors so that investors can um, participate in uh, the investment and conservation of this land that has ecosystem benefits you know, to the rest of the planet. So in short, you can capture additional value with land. That's right. Traditionally, we might use land just for farming or for ranching or growing timber and cutting it down. Mm -hmm. And um, Cecil and these other kind of nature-based solutions offer an alternative way to um, evaluate the value of land mm -hmm. by not basically, you know, um, destroying it or uh, trying to extract resources from it, but actually from preserving it okay. and having that land co contribute to the broader um, kind of uh, economy. Okay, thank you so much. It's so exciting. And Shell, <laughs> so it's your turn. Yeah, I think uh, one area that's going to be increasingly interesting is how do we manage sunlight? if if we have too much carbon dioxide in the air and the world's getting hotter, one of the natural things to think about is can we reflect more of the sunlight away? Can we dissipate it from buildings and can we lower our heating bills? And this ranges from everything to uh, special coatings on roofs to people thinking about replicating what volcanoes do and sending sulfurous ash into the air to cool down the planet. Um, this is gonna be probably something that gains more and more traction and more people talk about it in the future, but it's also fraught with risks and it may not be something that's viable for venture capitalists to think about, but it's something that I think everyone will have to start thinking about in a serious way because of the ramifications on the whole world. Yeah. So do you think it's going to be a great business opportunity when I, I don't talk know. about geoengineering? I, I don't know. I mean, so far, I, we struggle certainly to see any opportunity to build um, mm -hmm. a business around it, which is why we haven't done anything in this um, domain yet. But we have supported teams just gathering more information because to do it responsibly, you have to understand more about the earth and our climate and you need AI and supercomputers to build those kind of models. Because at the end of the day, you know, this might be one of those solutions that could harm people too if done not well. So we need to approach it with a lot of responsibility and respect. Mm. So it's interesting you are doing a lot of research on geoengineering, right? Because you're an investor and definitely, I think, I guess, there's a great opportunity in the future. We'll see, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, next question. Uh, this is also exciting to ask. So what is overhyped things in the recent trend in climate tech? So there are so many startups actually emerging yeah. in a ver across various industries, right? So from transportation, energy, or industrial chemical, or food and ag. But could you choose one or two overhyped things? Sure. Yeah, I think I would say um, uh, I'll start with uh, basically, you know, there are a few things that we have to do that are important uh, for climate change. One of them is we do have to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. We can't. We, we need to stop emitting, but we also need to take it out of the atmosphere. It's important, but I actually think that some of the technologies there right now are a little overhyped. Okay. So the, the main one is called direct air capture, and that's building oh. these large systems um, you know, the, the, that are essentially giant vacuums that suck air mm -hmm. and remove the CO2 and store it. Um, and you know, right now, it's very expensive to invest in these massive machines. 
Um, and they're much less efficient than, say, trees um, or other kind of natural forms mm -hmm. of carbon sequestration. So uh, yet there's a lot of money going into it. The idea is that over time it will be scalable. Uh, but I'm skeptical. I think actually, you know, I would prefer to go the route of let's use nature to kind of mm -hmm. sequester carbon than trying to just do it with machines. Um, Very, yeah, we'll see how it plays out. It is important, but I, but I think it's a little overhyped. Very interesting because Aurora Carbon actually has invested into this you know, space. I mean, direct air capture and carbon removal. Yeah. So, your yeah. opinion? I mean, uh, we, we are obviously very excited about removing carbon in, in all formats. And you know, I, I think, especially in the moment we're having now, it's, it's easy to perhaps underestimate the voluntary market and what's going on in that space. But I think we're also in a lot of conversations with large institutions and, and governments that have a lot of enthusiasm to do carbon removal. And so it, it perhaps is one of those situations where we feel like we know something that other people don't. Um, on the underhyped side, mm -hmm. I think going back to the original theme of never betting against technology, people always underestimate what exponential growth can look like. Mm -hmm. And in the case of things like fusion power, it's a perfect example of, I think, perhaps us looking at the past and not really understanding how quickly progress can be made, thanks to the invention of such things as AI and computer modeling that gives people the ability to not have to build like a $300 million plasma magnetic you know, uh, confinement chamber and instead do some of this work with computers in silico. And so for us, we expect more progress potentially to be made in fusion in the next five years than perhaps even the last 50 due to some of these technological breakthroughs. Very interesting because a lot of people still think like, oh, nuclear fusion is... Always 10 years uh, away. Yeah, it's <laughs> almost impossible to yeah. make it commercial. So yeah. what, do you, what are you seeing in a nuclear fusion area? So why you can say it's viable or in your future or it's possible to make a commercial you know, plan yeah. with nuclear fusion technology. I, I think the way to break down big problems is to reduce them into a string of smaller problems. And then you see if the teams are able to successfully solve challenge after challenge after challenge. And, and that's exactly what we're seeing in the fusion space. You know, overall, very, very, very intimidating problem. But we're seeing real traction with milestone after milestone after milestone being hit at a rate that I think will surprise a lot of people. And I, I, I expect over the next year or two, the kind of progress mm -hmm. that we see being more and more public to be a real shock to people on the outside. So do you think it's an investable space for you, nuclear fusion? For me? Yes. Um, I mean, I, I, given the, um, I, I would say yes, but, um, it's a, an industry that requires a lot of capital to continue growing. Mm -hmm. yep. My fund is very small and modest. And um, uh, I, like to, I, I tend to focus more on things that don't need a lot of capital mm -hmm. um, kind of over time. So I have a little bit more of a software focus for that reason. Okay. So I personally do not anticipate investing in Fusion, but um, I'm, I'm grateful that other funds like Lower Carbon and other big ones for sure do. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. And this is the last question from my side. So what is a missing piece? And yeah, you can say anything you want, <laughs> especially to the Japanese audience or, yeah. Yeah, I would say, you know, um, one of the, you know, the main thing for climate change is it's, um, it's hard to really get on board with the idea of climate change, just the fact that it exists until it comes to your doorstep or affects you personally. Um, I also, you know, in California, where I grew up, we'd have wildfires over the summer, and then in more recent history, um, they started threatening a lot of towns um, and ruined a lot of lives, and it was very sad. Um, I, my hope is that not everyone in the world has to be directly affected by uh, the consequences of climate change right. um, to kind of want to participate in, in making a difference. And so, um, you know, I think in a sense, my challenge to you would be to um, seek to learn more about it um, and you know, potentially become an activist because the government won't change until kind of the people um, demand it. And corporations often respond to you know, markets and other things that people want on a financial way. And so activism can be very powerful in 
basically making demands of government and corporations that will then shape how the markets move. So we saw this you know, happening with, with Greta and um, in, in Sweden, and that's come over to the US. And probably in that like 2018, 2019 mm -hmm. window, yeah. that's sort of what um, you know, had a big impact on me yes. to, to start paying attention. Um, and so, you know, I, I basically think that it will take activism and importantly collaboration um, among a lot of people to decide that this is a, a problem that they want to put time and resources against. Um, and you know, if we can solve it for ourselves individually, we can also solve it for a lot of a lot of uh, okay. a lot of people who can't. Mm. Yeah. I love Thank that. you. I love that. I think very related to what Tommy is saying, like this is the most exciting fight of our generation. But unfortunately, the storytelling around climate has been off. We, we've been saying things in a doom and gloom and, oh, the future is so bad. And we've done a poor job inspiring and leading people with hope. And I, I think that's especially true for the younger generations, right? Human beings are capable of so many exciting things and to overcome impossible odds, to do amazing things for ourselves. But it's always better to lead with hope and optimism rather than the sad story about how humanity is doomed. I, I, I sit here today because I know we can fix this. And I want to inspire as many people, especially from the new generation, to join in this fight. This is an opportunity to lay hold of everyone's futures and to, to do something really meaningful, to earn good money, to work with some of the best people in the world. It, it's possible to have it all if you work in climate. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity. OK, so again, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Xiao, Tommy. Yeah. So it was for very exciting yeah. to have this session here in yeah. Tokyo. Honored thank to be you here. So much. Thank you so much for the audience for listening to us. Thank you. Huge round of applause.